All right. Okay, so the Think Loud is one of the main ways that we collected data for our study. Um, to give you a little bit of an idea of what a Think Loud is, um, a Think Loud is verbalizing your thoughts and your feelings as you're engaging in a text. Um, and here we looked at specifically working with the scriptures. Um, and then, what was it like? So when we did the think alouds with the religious experts, um, we had them select uh, one chapter from scripture that they wanted to read. Um, the purpose wasn't to get through the entire chapter, but to have them verbalize their thoughts and their feelings that they were having as they were engaged um, with the scriptures. Um, as they read, we asked them, or we prompted them with questions like, what are you thinking, or what are you feeling, or please keep talking, just to remind them to keep talking and telling us what they were thinking and feeling. Generally, this lasted about 15 minutes. Um, they could read out loud or in their head, but they would stop and tell us what they were thinking and feeling as they read the scriptures. Um, and the Think Aloud is useful for us because it gives us access to their thoughts and feelings as they're constructing uh, knowledge of the scriptures. So quickly, I'm going to model a Think Aloud for you. Did you have that? Oh, so I can't. <laughs> so I'm going to be looking down here on my piece of paper. Um, so. I'm going to model the Think Aloud for you. Um, the passage that we'll be working with today um, is 3 Nephi 11, verses 1 through 3. So I'll just do it for a minute or two, and then we're going to give you time to do this on your own as well. So as I, as I do this, I want you to be thinking um, about the things that you notice that I'm doing as I'm reading the text. So things that, so reading strategies that I'm using as I'm reading this text. So. The first thing that I notice is that we don't have um, the, the scripture heading, the chapter heading. Um, that's one thing that I read before I read scriptures, or a, a chapter. I like reading the heading so that I can get an idea of what the chapter is about. Um, but I do know that 3 Nephi, um, around this time, this is when Jesus is coming uh, uh, to the Nephites. Um, and there was destruction before he came. So that's one thing that I remember um, about this passage. And now it came to pass. Um, this is a phrase in the scriptures that I hear a lot, but I'm not really sure the, why it's important or what it means. And I a lot of times skip over that. <laughs> and now it came to pass that there were a great multitude gathered together. Multitude, I'm not sure. what. How big is the multitude? What's the number of people? I think it tells me later on in the passage, but I don't remember. There were a great multitude gathered together of the people of Nephi round about the temple, which is the land, in the land bountiful. I'm not sure why they're at the temple. Um, is there significance in the temple as to why they're at the temple? And when I think of the word bountiful, I think of the bountiful Utah temple. <laughs> so... Um, I'm picturing this, the Bountiful Utah Temple, actually, and I, I see these people ga gathered around the temple, and they were marveling and wondering one with another. I really like the words marveling and wondering, and I, again, I'm imagining these people gathered around the temple marveling and wondering about something. And we're showing one to another the great and marvelous change which had taken place. So the change, I think this is important, they're, they're, um, the change is the change in the land because of the destruction that had taken place before um, Jesus appeared to the Nephites uh, after his death. And they were also conversing about this Jesus Christ of whom the sign had been given concerning his death. Um, the sign, uh, I, I think of the... The three hours of darkness, I think it was. I don't remember. I just remember there was a sign. It was three hours for three days. I get it mixed up. <laughs> um, and I'll just go ahead and stop there. Um, and now, Eric. Eric will talk with you for a minute. All right, so Christian is going to
started doing. He would hear me reading the scriptures, and one of the, Susie and I were both really surprised when he started doing that. He started saying, he would look at the scriptures, lay down, and go, pass, 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 pass. <laughs> <laughs> because he hears that a lot. It's one of the ones that when you verbalize it, it's coming up over and over. I mean, so the, the fact that she pointed that as something, you know, that was part of her back. really like those words, marveling and wondering. I think of someone like in awe.
practices in the home and perhaps even in the church. So we're inferring some significance in this study here. So we know that scriptures are important in the church. Uh, they help us know what to teach. They develop our faith. They enlarge our memories. They convince us of the error of our ways. Uh, they bring us to a knowledge of God unto the salvation of our souls. President Hinckley said, and I quote, that he hoped scriptures would become, that our scripture study would become a love affair with the word of God. And he promised that as you read, your mind will be enlightened and your spirits will be lifted 
and you will have a wondrous experience with thoughts and words of things divine. So clearly, Scripture is important, not only for learning the gospel, but for our own spiritual development. But how much do we actually know about how members of the church read Scripture? We don't know much. Uh, Dennis Wright uh, conducted a study of about 1,600 Latter-day Saint youth and young adults, and he looked at how well they comprehended the Book of Mormon versus how well they comprehended conventional text or academic text. And he found some interesting things. He found that, about, that less than half of the participants comprehended the Book of Mormon at a proficient level. He also found that reading conventional texts didn't transfer into reading scripture well. So there are things in scripture that are not accounted for in conventional texts. He also found that the participants were better at understanding scripture when they got older or graduated from high school. So there's a maturity aspect to understanding or comprehending scripture. He also found that the students struggled most with doctrinal passages as opposed to narrative or expository passages. Yeah, that was an interesting takeaway from this. This study was never published. It was presented at a BYU conference. So not very many people outside of the conference have heard about this. So as an outline of youth's struggles with scripture, <coughs> this work is important, but we still don't know how Latter-day Saint youth read scripture until last year. So I published a comparative study between Methodist youth and Latter-day Saint youth. It was a two-year study, and I looked at how each of these groups of youth um, engage with scripture. And the findings are really interesting. The Methodist youth were involved in a culture of interpretation, which was characterized by active engagement in the construction of meaning. So they talked a lot. The youth talked to one another, often using um, extended phrases, uh, but they were focused. The adults kind of backed away a little bit and facilitated more than directed what they should say or what they should do. They were also actively trying to figure out what scripture might mean as opposed to what it says specifically. But when we switch to the Latter-day Saint group, the Latter-day Saints uh, were involved in a culture of listening, where, which was characterized by a passive reception of what scripture said. So they tried to memorize specific verses. They um, tried to uh, get the right answer out of a verse. So they were looking for what it said, not what it could possibly mean. And the youth said that they went into scripture um, with the intention of believing what they were reading. So, and I pushed them a little bit and I said, well, has there ever been a time you disagreed with what you read? All of them said, no, never. And so I tried to lower the bar a little bit and say, well, has there been a time where you thought, maybe I might not agree with that completely? And they all said, nope, never. So there's this very clear uh, attention to believing what they were reading. So this study is important because as far as I know, it's the first study that actually explores how Latter-day Saint youth read scripture. This coming year, I have another study coming out that actually profiles five Latter-day Saint youth and how they read scripture. And it's interesting because this study identifies um, a student that primarily summarizes everything he reads. So when he would read his, his scriptures, he would translate scripture language into modern English. So for him, the issue was, what does scripture say? There was another student who would just make a lot of fact-based comments. So she was trying to um, make personal observations of her scriptures. Another student would make all these connections. So he was thinking, well, what is scripture like? How does it influence, or how does my background knowledge influence what I'm reading? Another student made a lot of inferences. So he was trying to figure out lessons and how they might apply to his life. One of the youth engaged in scripture as a problem-solving process. So she went in looking to see what the scriptures could possibly mean. And she was continually trying to construct conditional knowledge as she was engaged in the text, looking for answers, but not stopping at the first answer she came across. But she was continually digging in, and I refer to it as plumbing the depths of the verses. So 
That's what we know as far as the published research goes about how Latter-day Saint youth read scripture. So we primarily have two studies or two published studies and then one presentation. I'm sure there are more, but I haven't been able to find anything. So our knowledge base is pretty limited. Yet, as far as we know, we've done a little bit of work on this, we don't know anything about how Latter-day Saint experts read scripture. And that's where this study fits in. So this idea of disciplinary literacy gives us a theoretical entry point into exploring Latter-day Saint religious experts reading their scripture. Because disciplinary literacy looks at the strategic disciplinary ways that experts in their field engage with text. So I'm talking specifically about the habits, processes, practices, ways of thinking and working that in this context, religious experts would engage with scripture. So again, this helps us, or this construct of disciplinary literacy helps us explore the religious experts' reading practices. So our, we had four religious experts, and they're all time, or full-time religious educators at the same university, which is this one. <laughs> and they've been teaching for a variety of years. I think the longest one we've had that has been in religious education was 44 years, um, and they had a variety of religious specializations. So this, just an idea of who they were. So we had a couple sources of data. Um, we gave, um, we had them participate in a background interview, which just kind of gave us an idea of the professional background, uh, their thoughts about scripture and scripture reading, and how they think about teaching scripture, and then. We invited them to participate in a reading process interview, which was essentially uh, the Think Aloud protocol that you just participated in. We're drawing our findings from the reading process interview. And all the, both of the interviews were audio recorded, semi-structured, they lasted just under an hour. To analyze the data, this was our analytic focus. How do religious experts read scripture? And how is that scripture reading manifest by virtue of the specific practices that they used, okay? We used inductive thematic analyses to analyze the data. So we read and reread the interviews. We focused on how they verbalized their thinking and on identifying these specific approaches. After we identified all of the approaches for each of them, we added them up, we created a matrix, and we started to um, tease apart some of those uh, strategies that we saw. We started to group strategies together that looked similar. Uh, so in the end, we came up with a matrix that represented some of the common strategies that were used across the experts and some of the unique strategies that only surfaced with one of the experts. So we're looking for depth and breadth here. When or as we were analyzing if we, there was any disagreement we settled the, dis dis the disagreement by talking through what we were seeing and by going back into the data, rereading the data, and reanalyzing the data. So Christiana now is going to um, give you our preliminary findings. So he, he already introduced our findings just a little bit. So we put him into, we came up with two preliminary findings. Um, one, to give us a general sense of how the experts read scripture and their reading strategies, and then we also found the unique reading strategies to give us a sense of the, own, the unique individual readers. So these are our top five most common reading strategies that the experts use as they read scripture. So across the top we have our participants, and the totals down the right hand side, and then on the left hand side we have the strategies. So. Um, Interpretations were the most common reading strategy that the experts used as they read scripture. Um, so they explored what the um, passages uh, might mean as they read. Um, and as you can see, Michael and Aaron did this a lot, where Peter and David didn't. These are pseudonyms. Yes, these are <laughs> pseudonyms. Thank you. Stop everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Can't figure out who it is. <laughs> Um, and then uh, the second most common reading strategy was summarizing. Um, so, yes, uh, saying 
condensing the scriptures down into simpler words. Um, and Michael did that a lot. Um, the third most common was using the resources. So that's, um, we mean like using the footnotes, reading footnotes. Um, one even added their own footnote. Um, one of them was trying to make sure one, it was correct. Um, so it was really interesting to see that how they used the footnote. Um, and Aaron uh, and David did a lot. Um, and the fourth one was can making connections. So we're talking about text-to-text -text connections within the scriptures and then also connections between scriptures and themselves. They're, um, and Aaron did it a lot, so did Michael and Peter. Um, and then last, prior knowledge. So uh, some of the things that I did, the historical um, prior knowledge. Some had uh, language, prior knowledge of languages, um, prior knowledge of... Oh, yes. Yes, thank you. Um, and so across the board, they did it pretty, or they, they did it except for Peter. Um, so we just thought this was interesting to show you the, the, five, the top five um, strategies that they use as they read the scriptures. <coughs> so just to give you um, specific examples, um, we took the, the, the most common reading practice that all of the um, experts engaged in. And Michael, this is one example, he was reading the verse in James 1, 9 and 10, which says, Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted, but the rich in that he is made low, because as the flower of the grass he shall pass away. So he interpreted this by saying, <clears throat> right after he read the scripture, there really is no future in being rich, because wealth really doesn't have any meaning beyond this life. If you are a rich guy, then you really do have some concern, because that which you prize most, prize the most, you are going to lose. So he was <clears throat> in, interpreting the scripture or thinking about what it might mean um, by using what the text says and his prior, and his knowledge of what the scriptures say. And again, that was the most common. So this was just one specific example that they had used. Um, connections. Uh, Peter uh, used connections, and this is one example that he used. Uh, the verse he read in Alma 10, 1 says, Now these are the words which Amulek preached unto the people who were in the lam land of Ammonihah, saying, and then he stopped there to make the connection. And he, this is an example of a text to next text-to-text text connection, sorry. These are, he said, these are the words, is in fact the title of Deuteronomy in Hebrew, which is a legal text, interestingly enough. Um, so he made this connection between uh, the words in Deuteronomy and the words in Alma. So that was very interesting. And then this is an example of a text-to-self connection, a personal connection. Um, Aaron read in Alma 4, and he said, or the verse said, And thus ended the eighth year of the reign of the judges, and the wickedness of the church was a great stumbling block to those who did not belong to the church. And so he stopped there and made the personal connection, and he said that, And now I'm remembering area of my mission I served in, where there were <coughs> four excommunicated bishops living within the boundaries. The ward had regressed into a branch, and people I baptized wound up going inactive because of the leadership. Well, that's their excuse. Um, so here he's making the connection between what it says in the scriptures and what it reminds him of in, in his personal life. And then now we're going on to the unique reading strategies that we talked about, the ones that only one of the experts used as they read scripture. Um, <coughs> and these are just a few. I think there were some other unique reading strategies that we'll go into after this slide. Um, Aaron was the only one that made and used annotations, so he underlined or highlighted um, as he was reading, and he used those an uh, annotations that he had already had in his scriptures to make sense of what he was reading. Michael argued against the cultural practice, um, so he read something in the scriptures and he um, compared it to a cultur cultural practice now and argued why it was or wasn't appropriate. 
Um, Peter recognized unique information. Um, so, like, for example, he said once, um, we don't have an example of this in the scriptures except for in the, his passage. Um, and so that was really interesting, and he was the only one that noticed the, the unique information in the passage that he was reading. Um, and David was the only one that identified the spirit out loud. So the other um, experts may have uh, felt it or identified it, but none of them said it verbally. He was the only one who told us that he felt the spirit. So that was really interesting. Um, and here's some, just another example, a specific example of one of the reading strategies one of them used. Um, Michael amended the text. So amend, by amending, I mean that he changed the language of the scriptures as he was reading it. It wasn't after he read it, but while he read, which was really interesting. Um, so the verse that he read, one of the verses he read, was in James 1, and it's the original verse says, For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. That's the original verse, but what he actually said, and as he was reading the scriptures out loud to me, he said... For if anyone be a listener of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man who looks at himself in a mirror, and he supposed to, supposed himself, and he goes straight away forgetting what manner of man he was. So the words in red are the words that are different from the original verse. Um, and we thought this was really interesting that he would add words, take out words, um, skip over words. Um, and so we asked him why he did this and this was his response he said as i read the king james as i read the king james english i think to myself what is this saying this is a purpose purposeful strategy that helps me reconstruct the meaning of the archaic text it also cues me to nuances that i might have skipped over if i just passed my eyes over the text when i find a passage difficult to translate it is a cue that i need more something to understand this passage, for example, background, context, or language specifics. And then he gives us this analogy. He said, I suppose I am surfing the scriptures, looking for the feel of the text that enables me to connect with it. For me, there is a sweet spot that comes where I, can where I feel I can best reconstruct meaning. So I thought that was really interesting that he amended the text as he read, and he actually did this 67 times. In, in one chapter. So that was that was really interesting. And it was a way for him to construct meaning of the, the scriptures as he was reading. Did he actually write it in the scriptures, or did he just say this aloud as he was going through? Um, he just said it out loud. Sometimes he would stop. Uh, actually, I don't think he made any annotations. But he had previous annotations on his scriptures. Yeah. Um. And then another specific reading strategy that just one expert used was he clarified his purpose for reading. Um, so as he read, he would say things that um, he would say things that would um, clarify his purpose for reading. For so for teaching something. Um, <laughs> so this is one. This is just one example. He, uh, Aaron was reading in Alma 4, and it said, And it came to pass that in the eighth year of the reign of the judges, that the people of the church began to wax proud, because of their exceeding riches, and their fine silks, and their fine twine linen, and because of their many flocks and herds. Oh, can I skip one? I don't know. Many flocks and herds, and their gold, and their silver, and all manner of precious things that they had obtained, which they had obtained by their industry. And all these things... <coughs> And all these things they were lifted up in the pride of their heart and the pride of their eyes, for they began to wear very costly apparel. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, and so after he read this scripture, he stopped and said, so again, I read these scriptures and I think about lessons. And I'm deciding not to teach a lesson like that. It's too preachy. So it was really um, interesting because he would stop and think about lessons that he could teach as he read the scriptures. Um, deciding whether he wanted to teach it or not, or what he could possibly teach about that passage that he was reading. Um, so yeah, that was he was the only one that did that as he read. 
So what's the, what are the implications? Um, well, this <coughs> implies that there are a variety of ways to read scripture and that there's not just one way, one correct way to read the scriptures. Um, as you notice, as you read the scriptures, we all did different, we all have different reading strategies and they help us construct knowledge of the scriptures as we're reading. Um, and then also, uh, although there's a lot of variety of different ways that we engage in reading the scriptures, there were five common ways that the experts engaged in reading the scriptures. And again, those were interpreting, summarizing, using the scripture resources, making connections, um, and activating their prior knowledge. <coughs> Sorry. Um, and then last, um, we, we hope that this study um, can also inform our own scripture reading practices. Um, and uh, by looking at what they're doing as they read scripture, it might help us to be more attentive to how we read the scriptures.